Lovely. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for attending this evening's um, session. Um, my name is Emma and I um, work for the Department of Primary Industries um, and helping to facilitate um, some pest animal um, management across New South Wales at the moment. So, um, yeah, I'm really happy that um, you've all um, made some time to jump online with us this evening. And um, I hope that you like the presentations that we've got in store for you all tonight. Uh, I'd also like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land in which we gather today and pay my respects to elders past and present. I extend that uh, respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here with us this evening. Um, so as I mentioned, my name's Emma and I've got a background in vertebrae pest um, research um, uh, within New South Wales Department of Primary Industries, um, but more recently I've been helping communities to use the feral scan um, resource um, so that we can uh, help or assist people in pest animal management. So tonight we've got um, three presentations um, and uh, we're recording tonight's session so that um, you can all access the presentations um, for a later date. Um, and I will also send around some additional resources via email, um, including the webinar link, um, and some contact details for your local area as well. Um, and in addition, there's just a short feedback form um, which we'll send around uh, following the session. So it'd be great to um, hear what you guys thought about the session and if there's anything else that you'd like to um, learn about or any other resources that you might, um, you might find appropriate as well. Um, so we're, our presenters, our first presenter is um, Sean. Um, he's the, he helps coordinate um, the invasive species um, team at the Northern Beaches um, Local Council. He's responsible for delivering um, council's pest species and priority weed management programs across the Northern Beaches. And Sean's been involved in pest management for 15 years. He's completed the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries Vertebrae Pest Control Course and the Local Land Services Vertebrae Pest um, Vertebrate Pesticides Induction Training um, and Sean's presentation tonight's covering um, foxes in, within the Northern Beaches region, um, what council's role is, um, what programs exist uh, and how community can um, help out and how you can get involved um, in the local area. The next presentation will be from Gareth. Uh, Gareth Cleal works uh, for Greater Sydney uh, Local Land Services He's a biosecurity officer and has been for the past four years. He's coordinated pest control programs um, and works alongside landholders to support and assist them with their pest management strategies. Gareth pre previously worked for National Parks and Wildlife Services as a pest officer as well. All right, so without further ado, um, I will first I'll run through just a couple of housekeeping slides. Um, to help you use Zoom for those who perhaps may not have used the device before. All right, um, Sean, I'll just get you to pop on mute for a second too. Um, so let's start from the beginning. So to ask a question, I've got you all muted um, this evening, but there is a chat option um, in Zoom. And if by any means you can't ask a question this evening, feel free to follow up with us at a later date. So if you're using a desk-based computer, down the bottom, click on chat. That will open up the side panel and then you can type your message down the bottom right-hand side. Depending on how we go for time tonight and the nature of questions, um, we'll try to get to your questions, but some might be addressed um, out, out of session as well. To change your screen view so that you can see the presentation as opposed to everyone else, uh, first click on view and then click on speaker. If you're using a mobile device, you can swipe left or right on your screen to change the view. And please keep your video off um, so that we have a little bit more stable internet. Uh, if you click more or the three dots on your mobile device, that will also open up the chat box where you can type uh, your questions. All right, I will now pass over to Sean for our first presentation. 
can find you in the list, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, Emma. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming along tonight. Just hold, bear with me. Righto, so as Emma said, I'm gonna go through uh, just a bit of an overview of foxes on the Northern Beaches, uh, council's control program, and some examples of where uh, community participation has supported our program. Uh, all right, technical issue with the slide. Just give me one. There we go. Um, so as is the case across many parts of Greater Sydney, we do have an established fox population on the Northern Beaches. In the last 12 months, we have received over 125 sightings and 23 reports where native or domestic animals have been attacked. Uh, the map on the slide there is taken from FoxScan and that shows the distribution, of those reports um, from April last year to April this year. Um, the one thing we don't have is an accurate population count. Um, of the 125 recorded sightings there, some of those um, may have had multiple foxes recorded in the one sighting. Um, there's also the chance that it is the same fox being recorded or observed on multiple occasions. Um, what we're also finding is that foxes are being seen further away from the urban fringe. Um, and sort of being sort of uh, attracted into more residential areas. This could be down to the popularity of keeping backyard chickens, um, providing a food, food source in areas that foxes may have previously avoided. Um, the other thing that we're also finding is that we get a number of foxes uh, captured on home security cameras. Um, once again, if these weren't installed, these are foxes that may have gone undetected. So the, what are the local impacts from foxes? Uh, they prey on our native fauna, including penguins, bandicoots, possums, and wallabies. Foxes are considered a key threatening process for a number of endangered species, including the little penguins on North Head and the Southern Brown bandicoots in Karingai National Park. Uh, they also attack domestic animals, including poultry, rabbits, and guinea pigs. Um, with that, we do get some inquiries about from pet owners about uh, foxes attacking either cats or um, dogs, um, especially if people have got a new puppy. Uh, locally, we haven't had any reports of that occurring. However, there is a risk that foxes can spread diseases and parasites to domestic dogs. Um, they are also known to contribute to the spread of berry producing weed species. Uh, they are opportunistic feeders, so things like blackberry can be included in their diet. So Council's uh, control program. Council has an ongoing fox control program in place. Uh, we operate year round with the exception of the school holidays. The increased usage in our reserves during this time, especially over the December, January period, tends to sort of hamper our ability to do some control works. Um, some of the activities that we undertake also involve us having to close the reserves, uh, especially to dog walkers. So uh, this will also influence when, uh, what time of year we undertake control works. We have three council officers involved in fox management. Uh, we all undergo regular training with Department of Primary Industry and local land services just to ensure that all our relevant qualifications are up to date and that we are using industry best practice. We also have a panel of contractors that we can engage to undertake work. Uh, generally, we use these contractors for shooting operations, fumigation, and to assist with any trapping we may undertake. Uh, currently, all our baiting is done in-house by council staff. So where we can operate um, is determined by legal and safety requirements. Um, there's some areas where we can operate freely and there's others where we're severely restricted. Um, I just want to assure everyone that um, as this may be a source of frustration as you see foxes roaming around and it looks like nothing's been done about it, it is also a great source of frustration 
for us as well, because uh, like you, we share you know, um, the concerns about the impacts that foxes have on our native and domestic animals. What we do have though is 130 sites where we have done a risk assessment and they are safe for shooting. Uh, we generally have professional sh shooters operating between three to four nights each month outside of the school holiday periods. Uh, the shooters will either be out undertaking rabbit control work where they can do opportunistic fox control work if they observe a fox on site, um, or if we have good intel and it sort of warrants, um, warrants the work, we can actually go out and do a couple of nights of just targeted fox control, um, which we've done in a few locations recently. Uh, we have 18 sites where we can legally bait. Uh, baiting is generally undertaken twice a year in March and November. Um, we do not bait all the sites um, every year. We tend to rotate through the sites. Uh, this is based on where foxes are active. Plus also um, we need to be aware of foxes becoming bait shy. So if we hit the one site too often, we may actually deter the foxes from taking the baits. Um, in the last 12 months, we haven't done any fox baiting. Uh, the reason for this is with COVID lockdown and restrictions, we're finding that um, we have a lot more people using our reserves. Um, a lot of people are exercising close to home and probably in hours of the day that they wouldn't ordinarily exercise. Uh, this just increases the risks associated with um, fox baiting. So at this point in time, we've postponed any baiting, but um, I guess as life gets back to normal, we will look at resuming our baiting program. Um, in addition to these sites, um, there's also New South Wales National Parks undertaking fox baiting on their parks across the northern beaches. We also have a number of the local golf courses which engage contractors to undertake rabbit control. And sometimes this can result in some opportunistic fox control being done at the same time. Uh, Council also utilises den fumigation. Uh, soft jaw trapping and cage trapping. Um, den fumigation is done on an as-need as basis. Um, after fumigation, we tend to monitor the den sites for a period of time because what we've found is that the um, pups that were reared in that den can sometimes come back as adults. And if those dens are vacant, um, they will reoccupy those dens. So, um, it's good to know where those locations are for ongoing monitoring. Um, with the trapping, trapping is labour intensive. Um, it's not something that we undertake on a regular basis, but it is still a uh, control option available for us to use. Uh, since uh, July, uh, yes, yeah, since July 2021 to date, uh, we've culled 30. 30 foxes and in the previous 12 months, we cull 46 foxes. So um, once again, that's just the foxes culled on council land. That doesn't take into account any um, numbers that national parks may have uh, culled or some of those other organisations that I was speaking about may have culled as well. So what's council's role and responsibility in fox management? Uh, we, as a landholder, have a legal obligation to reduce the impact from foxes on our land where it's reasonably and pract practical to do so. Council is also a member of the Sydney North Vertebrate Pest Committee. The Pest Committee comprises a group of key land managers from across Sydney's north, including councils, national parks and wildlife, local land services, forestry in New South Wales, Sydney Water, Taronga Zoo and Sydney Harbour Federation Trust. The aim of the group is to share information, raise awareness, educate its member and develop the skills required to manage feral animals, including foxes. Um, we also provide advice to residents and other landholders wishing to undertake fox control. Um, an example of where we have done this was we were contacted by a local high school um, that thought they had a fox on their, a uh, fox den on their property. Um, they weren't too sure sort of who they should speak to, what they should be doing. So we organised to go out and meet them on site. Um, we did a joint inspection of the grounds and we actually located the fox den. Um, from there, they were able to engage a uh, contractor who was uh, successful in culling that fox. 
And so uh, community participation, uh, fox sightings made by community members are invaluable for assisting with the planning of fox control activities. The more information we have, the more targeted we can be maximising the resources we have available to undertake control works. A um, couple of examples of where community participation has helped with our control program is we received reports from a resident that had a um, that observed a number of chicken po possum carcasses in a road cutting opposite their property. Uh, we went out and had a look and found that it was actually a den site. Um, unfortunately, because of the way the den was, I guess, uh, not really constructed, but they'd basically done it in a sandstone outcrop. So it wasn't something that we could fumigate easily. So on that occasion, we uh, had the ability to set a cage trap and we actually ended up in capturing a juvenile fox. Um, unfortunately, mum, mum evaded us and is still at large, but it's, once again, it's an area that now that we know, we sort of monitor for signs um, and that den doesn't seem to have been reoccupied since we undertook that trapping activity. Um, we also had bush care volunteers report a number of suspected fox, fox dens across multiple sites. Based on those sightings, we were able to go out, do some inspections, determine which dens were um, active, and then we sort of undertook a fumigation program for those, those dens and been monitoring since. Um, one was reoccupied, which we retreated, but the others remained vacant. Um, and recently we had members of our penguin wardens observe fox prints around Little Manly following a fox sighting in that area. Uh, this resulted in a targeted operation that culled three foxes that could have potentially impacted on the little penguin population around North Het. And uh, we also recently we've received multiple reports of a fox active around the war vets in the surrounding streets and parks at Narrabeen there. Uh, we completed a risk assessment for shooting around the lagoon foreshore. Um, this was an area that we had not previously shot in and we were able to identify um, an area that we could operate safely in following that risk assessment. Uh, we now have an ongoing uh, program target, targeting the fox in that area. Um, to date, it's, once again, it's managed to elude us, but at least we know that it's an area where we can sort of take action that previously we would not have been able to take. Um, so I please encourage you to report any sightings into Fox Scan or direct to council. Um, with, um, in terms of helping the community, we're looking to establish a trap hire process to support residents to undertake fox control on their land. Uh, we currently have one in place for those who want to do a bit of rabbit control, um, but we're just sort of, yeah, looking at what we can do in this space to assist with fox control further. Uh, we need to just ensure that the program is adequately resourced and that we can uh, deliver it effectively um, to maximise sort of, I guess, our bang for our buck. And if you could please take steps to minimise foxes on your properties with the information that you'll learn tonight. And I guess importantly, just share it with your neighbours um, so we can sort of encourage a community approach to the problem instead of sort of all trying to do something in isolation. Um, that's it from me. I will now hand over to Gareth, who will talk about the impacts of, uh, of controlling foxes in an urban environment. Uh, so I'm sharing. We host stop video. Uh, all right, uh, Gareth, you should be the host now, yeah, mate. Did that come through? There you go, Gareth. Give that a go.
Thank you, Sean, and, and thanks for everyone for coming tonight. Sorry, we just a couple of uh, technical issues there, but we've we've worked through it. Um, like Em said, I'm Gareth Hill. I work for Greater Sydney Local Land Services. I'm a biosecurity officer. Um, I'm here to talk to you tonight about a few of the options where Sean's touched on what council can do on, on council land. I'm here to help some landholders who may not have those options to do that sort of control technique. So I'll touch on a few things such as, as cage trapping, as well as ways to minimise impacts that foxes have towards urban landholders. Just a little bit on foxes. Uh, they were successfully introduced to Australia in, in 1870 for the purpose of, of recreational hunting. Uh, they've, they've since thrived since. Um, they cause an estimated $227.5 million to the Australian economy. That's per year. So a pest control order for foxes has recently been gazetted in New South Wales, making them a declared pest to be controlled. A little bit about fox biology. Uh, winter is the mating season. Cubs are born in spring, um, rearing in summer and dispersal in autumn, which is, is where we're up to now. Uh, coming into winter, you'll hear some quite gnarly sounds that foxes make at that time of year. Um, quite daunting sort of sounds if you haven't if you haven't been exposed to them before. But um, the litter size is average from four to ten cubs. Um, vixens only reproduce once a year. Dense, densities in urban areas recorded as high as 16 per square kilometre. So it's quite a large number of foxes that, you know, while Sean's touched on, on the amount of foxes that have been recorded, there's quite a few more that, that haven't been. So um, their home ranges are about 30 hectares in urban areas and then up to two to 300 hectares in semi-rural areas. They can travel up to 10 kilometres a night and, and they're quite routine. I've, I've had foxes where, you know, we do a lot of camera monitoring on, on properties and there's some foxes you can nearly set your watch to. They're that routine when they go past the camera at the same time, at the same time every night. So um, where others, you know, are a lot more sporadic. Every fox is different and um, it, it's amazing that somehow routine they are and, and like clockwork when they go past these cameras. The dispersal range is about 40 kilometres after they've been kicked out of, out of the den, so to speak. Why do we control foxes? They play a huge environmental impact on, on all our native animals. I think Australia has the, the worst mammalian extinction rate in the world. We, our, our poor old um, native animals just don't stand a chance against a prolific predator such as the fox. They've, they've got little defence mechanisms to, to, to assist in their survival against a fox. So I worked prior to this job, I was with the, the National Parks and Wildlife and I was involved in a bit of the fox program at, at North Head with the little penguins and we were doing surveillance on the beach and just to watch them come up on the beach and, and into their, you know, where they harbour, it was, they're just so vulnerable, they were, they were there for the taking. So it's, you know, we've got to do everything we can to, to minimise the impacts on our native animals. Agriculture, is a, is, a, is a large figure of 200, over 220 million. Um, during lambing season, it's, it's not unusual for a fox to take 10 to 30% of, of lambs each, each year that they lamb. So it's a huge impact on our agriculture sector as well. These, they are a carrier of rabies, even though we don't have it in Australia, uh, they could carry rabies if it was to enter and they can spread diseases such as hybatus, parvovirus, the copying mange to humans, domestic pets and livestock. How do we control foxes in urban areas? It's, it's one of the biggest challenges that we have in our industry. It's, you know, um, where you've got the space to do the, the techniques that Sean's using is, is uh, a lot more beneficial, but where you're working on, on small landholders, it, it, the control techniques um, really are limited. So I'm gonna to touch a little bit on um, cage trapping tonight, but you know, you'll notice that all these photos were taken during the day. I'm, I'm gobsmacked with how many phone calls I get saying of reports of foxes during the day. It's, it's almost, a, I never get a fox call now that, that don't mention that they've sighted this fox during the day. Now there's a couple of reasons for that. We're at home more because of COVID. Um, but yeah, it, and the foxes, are, you know, they become more brazen. They've got no natural predators in them urban areas. The food source is, you know, unlimited. So um, yeah, it's amazing. And, and where I'm getting these calls from, back porches, um, front doors, it's, yeah, they are, they are coming ever so brazen. So it does make control a little bit harder. 
simple tips just to reduce some fox problems. Um, don't leave your pet food out overnight. You'll see there's a fox there coming into a dog bar that's been left out. So it really is a big one, leaving the fox um, food out for foxes overnight. Keep your compost bins enclosed. Lock in your pets at night. Um, remove fallen fruit from trees. I, I remember, you know, sometimes you, you'll see fox get and it's just littered with um, blackberry seeds and things like that. So they, they really are opportunistic. They'll find uh, or scavenge for food wherever they can. So the, the more effort you can put into minimising those around your house or, or around your land, then uh, the impacts will decrease eventually with the foxes. So close off access to underneath, underneath buildings, use fox-proof enclosures for poultry, which I'll touch a bit more on. Uh, turn outside lights off, that might attract insects. Um, it's not unusual to see scats as well, just full of beetles and things like that, where they've just been scavenging around. Um, reduce weeds that provide food and shelter, such as African olive, uh, blackberry, and, and they love you know, harboring in Lantana as well. And don't feed native wildlife as they become vulnerable, more vulnerable to predators as well. Other control options, we've got exclusion fencing. A lot of people um, touch on their, their chicken coops and, and, and say, oh, a fox got in and killed all my chickens. Uh, there's a couple of things you can do is, is really buy a good chicken coop whether it's fox proof or, or bury your mesh under the ground up to 500 mil and then, you know, have that so the foxes can't dig underneath that. The first thing I'll do is I'll come to a fence, dig underneath, get in and kill your chickens. Uh, a lot of the times um, they'll kill all your chickens and they'll just take the heads off and, you know, they'll leave the rest of the carcass there. So it's, sometimes it's, you know, it's a little bit of a play killing for them as well. So, you know, but people say I wouldn't mind if they took the whole thing, but often nine times out of 10, they'll just take the heads off and, and leave the rest. Uh, guardian animals, not, you know, there's some, uh, cases where it could work in, in the northern beaches, but there's, um, you know, alpacas, maramas and things like that that people use for, for our guardian animals. The next three, den fumigation, ground shooting and leg hold trapping are best done by contractors. Uh, I'd, I'd advise if you've, if you've got something on your land to contact a contractor that offers these, offer these services uh, to use them and, and use their capacity to do that sort of work. It's a unique skill set. Um, Ground shooting where applicable, yes, it's opportunistic, but it's very dangerous in, in the, you know, the areas and, and the contractors have to have special permits on their licenses uh, to do this. Predator lighting. Mixed report starts off well. Um, it's just a bright light that comes on when it senses that, you know, fox and things like that and, and to some other deterrents that they use. But um, I've found that it, it only works if it works for a short period. Uh, and then, you know, you, you've got it living in an urban area, you don't want a bright light flashing into your neighbour's property all the time as well. So uh, it might upset them a little bit. But yeah, really, really use fox proof enclosures for your poultry. I know people want to let the chickens out during the day and that's where, you know, you start to see more fox on because they know that these chickens are out during the day. But really use a fox proof enclosure if, you, if you're going to have chickens on your property. 1080 baiting where applicable as well as kind of pest ejectors are, are some other control options that we use. Age trapping and the, and the challenges it possesses, it can be um, very frustrating for landholders. We've, we've had landholders where they've put a trap out and they've trapped foxes within, you know, a couple of days or within the week. And then we've had landholders that have had um, traps out there for, for a long period of time. So it really is a game of patience and perseverance. A couple of things to do or look out for when you are doing a bit of cage trapping is bed the trap in securely. You don't want any movement or any, you know, anything that makes the fox uncomfortable, he'll just walk away. There's no need for him. There's a lot of feed out there, a lot of food source out there. So it has to be something that is comfortable to go in and out and, and not be hesitant to enter into that trap. Um, free feed the trap and bed it in. When you bed it in, you know, you've got a good cover of ground, put hessian bags over it, darken it up a little bit, you know, some bracken or whatever you might have lying around some some bushes and things like that. So just make it feel as natural as possible. Um, and then you want to free feed. So if you can have the option to lift both ends of the trap up, let the fox come in and out, get comfortable and you know start the process of closing one end and then setting the trap. And most importantly, you need to check the trap every 24 hours. Uh, if you're planning to go away for the weekend and things like that, it's really important you close the trap up. You don't want any inhumane issues. 
with the fox stuck in there on a hot summer's day and, and he's got no access to water and things like that. So plan ahead. If you're going away, close the trap and, and plan to have a, have a plan in place to euthanize, to euthanize a fox. So um, veterinarians, um, there's some vets in the uh, Northern Beaches Council that will um, euthanize as well as contractors to come out and, and dispatch the fox if needed. There's a really good um, document from PESMA on the standard operating procedure, and that gives you a good overview of what the requirements are to cage trap foxes. So if you have got the, um, the option to use a camera to, to, to monitor what the fox is doing, it's always helpful to see how close he was if he just walks past the cage trap if he's not interested. And it might be a case of, of changing up the bait material, the lure that you're using. Um, Awful chicken necks, chicken hearts work really well, chicken drumsticks, uh, fried chicken, wet dog food, anything fishy or oily, fishy and oily works really well. It's, it's a common theme here, chicken drumstick. These were um, taken from landholders that were in a previous cage trapping program and these were some of the things that they found work best for them. Um, you'll notice that there are a lot of savoury lures on here. I've tried a lot of sweet things, condensed milk, marshmallows, Every fox is different and don't be disheartened if he doesn't go in there and take a chicken neck or he doesn't take a chicken wing and you think, oh, what am I doing wrong? Persevere, change your bait material and, um, you know, you'll find something eventually that, that brings him in. Uh, cat food's another one that works really well. Fox scam, we've both touched on fox scam only briefly because Em's going to talk about it um, next, but it is a great tool for us to use to capture data and work out where we want to do future programs. Um, you know, we can really see the abundance of foxes in certain areas compared to other areas. So when we strategize our programs to where we want to target, um, fox scan is a great tool for us to look at and see where a lot of the activity is. I think that's an up-to-date version. I won't go into it too much in, but yeah, that's as of this morning, the, the, today, the fox sightings that have been recorded. In the past, LLS have engaged contractors to come and do workshops. Um, predominantly aimed at landholders that aren't able to use 1080 and, and things like that. So we, we engage a contractor to come and talk about doing leg hold trapping and cage trapping. Uh, it's a practical workshop and we've had some good success in the past where landholders have, have gone home and um, caught foxes via leg hold and cage trap. So it's just a good tool to have. It's, it's a good, you know, we do these regularly and when we, we do more in the future, keep an eye out for them. I highly recommend them. And um, yeah, you can really pick the brains of the contractor who's done this for a living and, um, you know, take something away from it. But I think um, that's about me. If you've got any questions, uh, feel free to write them in the messages. I'll get back to them as best I can or failing that, um, contact local answers and you'll come through to me at some stage as well. So, uh, M. I'll just make you host. Are you there? You're on mute, Emily. Yes, I'm here now. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sean and Gareth, for um, those presentations. They were um, really insightful. Um, I am now going to show you a little bit about the Feral Scan resource. Um, Up. Thinking about it. Wait, maybe I didn't press the button. Technology. All right. So um, I am currently working on a project um, called Feral Scan. So Feral Scan um, is um, offered through the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries and also the Centre for Invasive Species Solutions. So it's a national program. Um, and within Feral Scan, there's lots of different species um, that uh, you can report and record information about. But for tonight, we're going to talk about foxes since that's the theme of um, the webinar. Uh, so it's funded by a couple of different groups. As I mentioned, Centre for Invasive Species Solutions, Department of Primary Industries, Local Land Services, and Australian Wool um, Innovation. They're the main organisations that um, help fund this community resource. So why do people use feral, uh, fox scan? 
Well, as we've heard tonight, foxes uh, cause a great deal of um, impacts to our native wildlife and poultry, um, and also in the agricultural sector. Um, but here's some examples of uh, some of the impacts that um, have occurred in an urban landscape. So attacks on poultry, um, also digging up native turtle nests, um, and attacks on native birds and wildlife. But more importantly, um, FoxScan is a resource to help community members um, and other groups to reduce the damages that foxes cause. Uh, so there's no one silver bullet and every case is different, um, but FoxScan is a tool that can help um, individuals and groups um, to manage um, this species in the local area. Uh, and I'll go a little bit more into depth um, during my presentation. Just reiterating some um, points that Sean and Gareth have touched on. So there's some simple tips to reduce the impacts um, or to prevent or try to discourage foxes from uh, coming into your local area. And we'll send around this information following the presentation for you as well. But I just wanted to point out down the bottom there that um, FoxScan is just a suite of one of these tools that can help you and your local community um, to manage this species more effectively. So what is uh, FoxScan? Well, as I mentioned, it's a tool to help you reduce impacts. It's a community resource where you can report and map information about fox activity. So uh, we had a question tonight um, about, um, or a comment about seeing a fox in the local area. So you can um, record that sighting of um, the fox in fox scan. You can um, record where you've had damage um, to uh, maybe your poultry or maybe where you found, um, where you found a fox scat or some fox prints, for example. But the purpose is that um, it centralises that information so that um, the essential people can review the information such as local land services, um, local government and your local community. Um, and as a group, you can um, work together um, to make informed decisions about how foxes are managed in your local area. So, for example, that might be um, getting together with members of your local community um, having a look at the information that's in FoxScan and having a chat with um, people like Sean and Gareth and uh, making some decisions about what, um, what you're going to do locally, what, what control methods are available and, um, and where you will be targeting. So monitoring, planning and recording information. Uh, this is just a close up view of foxes that have been recorded throughout the Sydney region. I don't have time tonight to show you the fox scan map, but it's available to have a look online via the fox scan website. And I'll send you a link after tonight's session. But essentially um, the yellow dots are sightings. There's a few gray dots with D, the letter D in there. That's where damage has been recorded. Um, not too many control options here that are visible to the public. We have, um, we have special um, privacy settings um, that keep you and your local community safe um, when recording such information. But this just shows how widely distributed um, foxes are within the Sydney region. So FoxScan, you can use it as a mobile app or you can use it on your desktop computer. It's available on Apple or Android devices. It's really easy to use and free, much easier than Zoom. The so types of records that you can enter into FoxScan include sightings or evidence of foxes. So if you see a fox, if you've taken a photo of, fox, of a fox, or perhaps you put one on your um, home security um, camera, um, perhaps you, you find some fox prints or a fox scat in your backyard. Certainly the damage or impacts that they're causing. So for example, if they've um, come in to um, your um, chicken coop and they've um, caused some damage in that area. So mauling of um, chickens or um, destruction of chickens and control. So you can record when, where you're undertaking control. So you keep a record of that. Um, and as I mentioned, controls always kept private. So we don't release that 
um, information to just anyone in the community. Of course, um, Gareth and Sean might have access or special rights to view that information and that's so that they can um, assist community members like yourselves in making decisions around what might work best in your local area. This is what the FoxScan website looks like. So this is the homepage. The top right hand side is a map of Australia and you can use this map to view information about fox sightings, damage and control. But you can also use the map to record information about foxes as well. We've put some links to download the app um, on the FoxScan um, homepage as well. So if you're opening that from a mobile device, it can make uh, life just a little bit easier for you. Um, and we've also got some helpful links and resources on FoxScan as well. If you're using the map to record Fox information via your desktop computer or the website, uh, you simply click on the picture of Australia. Um, up the top left, there's a record data button. You fill in the form, click on the map to place your marker pin. So you can see that um, Fox right on Manly Beach there. If you've got a picture, you can choose to upload that um, and then click submit. The app is equally as easy to use. And the benefit of using the app while out in the field is it records your location. So it uses the phone's internal GPS um, and it also records the date and the time. So you, you simply open the app, uh, press Fox, uh, select your um, data type or record sightings here in this example. You fill in the form and then click submit. Um, you've also got an option for sightings and damage to um, display your record as public or to keep your record private. Um, so that option is up to you before you submit the record. Remembering that all control records are always kept private. This is another example of the Fox scan map. If you're clicking on the records, you can open some of the information and view um, details about those records. But importantly, once you submit your record onto the map, that information is sent through to um, people in your local area who really need to um, have that broad um, view of what's happening so that um, long-term um, control programs can be planned, um, as Sean was saying, um, sometimes they have contractors going out. So if they've got information from community members about where potential hotspots are, then they can make an assessment um, about the appropriateness of including that in upcoming, um, upcoming programs. And just some more examples of the types of records that you can be inputting into the system, into the FoxScan system. Gareth mentioned quickly that um, wildlife cameras are a really good way of um, learning about uh, what's happening in your local area in terms of foxes. So getting an understanding of how many are in the area, um, what time of the day uh, they're passing through a particular area, which direction they're going, are they taking native wildlife, um, are they looking at um, your lure or your bait types and, and are they appetised by it or are they not? So it gives you a really good idea of, um, of uh, the individual fox behaviour, which is um, sometimes um, a key part of, um, of management towards those individuals. So um, getting an understanding of how those um, different foxes are behaving. So how can we help you? We can certainly help you to create an account um, and we can provide instructions as well. And I will send you some instructions on how to use the resource um, following this evening session. Uh, we provide ongoing support to landholders via email, phone. Um, sometimes um, we can do these kind of sessions if you'd like something a little bit more intensive to get a really good understanding of the system. Uh, we send out resources to community members that might be printed resources. And we are always helping people connect with um, local groups and professionals because um, we really need to get um, lots of people from the community 
um, on board and helping out with control programs um, in your local area and your local patch. So we try to connect people um, with local groups and organisations where we can as well. Um, and here are some examples of the types of resources that we can send out to you. So we've got a simple instructions on how to use the Fox Scan resource. Um, you can use that yourself if you like, or perhaps that's something you can share with your neighbours in your local community. Um, and we've um, also got some printed um, glove box guides for managing foxes, which gives you a really nice overview of um, what the issues are of foxes in Australia, a bit about their biology, um, and it also details a little bit about um, control methods as well. So we might move on to addressing some questions now. Um, so please feel free to um, add any um, questions into the chat. Um, I will just make sure that um, Gareth and Sean can unmute. Okay, Gareth has to unmute. Thanks, Sean. Gareth, can you unmute yourself? Or... Um, um... Okay, yep, he's unmuted. All right, let's just have a look at the chat here. Okay. Beautiful, Sean. I can see that um, the record of the Fox signing has been entered into Fox again, and that's come through to you. Yep, yep. So I had a notification pop up on my email while you were doing the presentation about the signing being made. So, yeah, that sort of shows how quick it, quick it sort of comes through to us. Great, that's really good. Yeah, and um, of course, um, as I mentioned before, we'll send around the details as well. So, you, um, Margaret, if you have any further questions about, um, you know, what what you might be able to do moving forward in terms of that individual, then yeah, Sean and and Gareth and myself are more than happy to um, provide advice or help where we can. Um, we work together in that. Um, there was a question earlier in the chat, Sean. Um, yeah, about the the foxes that we manage, the control methods. Yeah, yeah so what, what's I've got your that one here? Yeah, yeah. Look, um, for us, um, past twelve months, as I said, without baiting, um, our primary control has been uh, shooting. Um, so I'd sort of say, out of, out of the um, out of the foxes in this financial year, all all um, thirty of those have been shot um, because we haven't had any baits in the ground and. Um, uh, we we tried. I tried sort of uh, trapping with a couple of residents. We tried a new style of trap that was double ended, um, but we managed to sort of um, and sort of a range of baits as Gareth was um, talking about. But we found uh, one particular bandicoot in particular liked uh, lamb chops and KFC apparently. So um, yeah, so we haven't had any success. Uh, Cage trapping, but in the previous 12 months, so the 46 foxes, um, one of those was was in a cage trap. Um, in terms of sort of um, effectiveness as well, um, just to give an example, was last time um, we tried some leg hold trapping. They talk about the number of trapping nights, so how many traps you have out over sort of a number of nights give you a number of trapping nights. So um, we had about 50 traps out over three nights, which is the equivalent of 150 trapping nights. And for that um, number of traps, we got a fox. Um, to put it in a bit of perspective, um, at the same time, uh, National Parks was uh, did a bit of leg hold trapping on North Head and Karingai, and they were sort of unsuccessful in getting any, any foxes. So yeah, so um, just because the traps out, are out there, it doesn't guarantee that you're necessarily going to capture an animal, as Gareth was alluding to before, despite the best efforts. Um, uh, yeah, I think we, yeah, we, our contractor was quite chuffed that he at least got something because he could sort of give the National Parks guys a bit of stick over sort of not getting anything on that occasion. Um, and they all work closely with each other. They all, they all know each other. So, yeah. Yeah, and then I think... Yeah, I think Gareth just answered that other question. Um, and before you jump in um, with addressing that, Gareth, I think there might be a little bit of research that looks at the timing that foxes and cats are out and, um, 
perhaps they're out at different times of the evening, which therefore um, uh, I, I will have a look for the research and um, I might pop a link in there to an article um, which might help to answer that. But Gareth, what's your experience in um, foxes suppressing cat, cats? Do you know? Um, in, in my in my experience, and I don't I don't think they suppress cats at all. I, I don't think they do either. No, they, as you say, they, I, I've seen them both on the on the same camera on the same nights multiple times over over a long period, and um, they they tend to more avoid each other rather than predate on it. Well, the fox is predating on the cats. So I think there's a lot easier food source out there than a, than a cat for a fox, and, and he tends to go down that, that avenue. Yeah, thank you. Um, and foxes in trees or jumping over five-foot fences? Yep, yeah, multiple photos of foxes in trees. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy how, how good of, uh, you know, climbers they are and, and, and on roofs and things like that. It's, I've... You know, had a lot of calls from landholders explain to me where they they saw foxes and and you know nothing. I don't think anything's been left unturned. Like, there's nowhere a fox hasn't been <laughs> before the reports are true. So yeah, they're incredible um, at what, what they do. Yeah, they're in my experience, they're definitely really good um, climbers. Um, I'm a country girl myself, and we've had um, chickens before, and we had a very high fence. Um, but it didn't have that lip at the top and it certainly um, were more than capable of climbing that. So. All right. Are there any other questions? I'll give you a minute um, to type in the chat if there are. And while we're waiting... Yeah, Emma, there's, uh, yeah. yeah there's one about why foxes sometimes just decapitate chickens and don't actually mm. eat them. Happens a lot, Sean. I... Uh, every every second call I get where a fox has got into a chicken coop, you know, it, the fox are just taking the heads off. There's theory that they, you know, they're, they're play killing or that they may be training their young, but even if they can't get into the, the coop or the, uh, the the bird sticks its head out, it'll still take the head off it and just leave the rest. So it, it is very, very common. Um, and I, I don't know whether it's just the foxes that do it for practice or play killing, so to speak, but um, yeah, it does happen quite often. Um, just jumping back over to the feral scan resource too, I wanted to just make one comment. Um, it is really easy to use. So I highly, highly encourage you um, to download the app and um, have a look through it. Um, it's, it's very simple. Um, and the best way to um, get a hang of it is to have a go. But um, by all means, if you, um, if you need any help, make sure you let me know as well. Um, please don't feel afraid to use it. Um, because it, we have kept it really, really simple. Um, that's it. Okay, so there's another question um, in the chat as well. Um, can I also ask what courses are best um, to become qualified in managing feral pests? I think that might be aimed at you, Gareth. Yeah, TOCAL do the Veteran Pesticide Induction Training, which I'd recommend. You know, even if it's education on on other control techniques such as 1080, and uh, there's some um, control techniques in there for rabbits and things like that as well. Um, but I'd certainly be starting there with the veteran pesticide induction training, and then looking at other options at Tokel or uh, workshops. Keep an eye out for workshops. We we try to run as many workshops as we can aimed at landholders that you know can't necessarily use other control techniques. So um, there's a lot of training out there with agencies that do through workshops and things like that as well. Yeah, um, there is a question around um, the use of baiting um, and can that be, um, I'm slightly rephrasing, can it be used more often or more frequently, but um, perhaps it might be good to discuss um, what some of the risks are and why there's, why there so, are so many restrictions on the use of baiting, particularly in urban areas. Yep. yep, New South Wales is, is the heavily legislated area for, for 1080 baiting. Um, there's a lot of risk. There's an ACO that will, you know, will come out and do an on-site selection, but the uh, on-site assessment. But uh, one of the biggest risks is non-target that we look for are domestic dogs. So um, there's a, what they call a pesticide control order, which is what regulates the use of 1080, uh, and everything has to abide by that pesticide control order. So there's a lot of risks that go in 
or a lot of risk mitigation that goes into that pest control order, such as distance from, you know, boundaries, sizes of properties and things like that. So all that has to be adhered to. And then uh, it's a step-by-step -step process, you know, it's a, a case by case. So then if, you know, if they can meet the requirements of the pesticide control order, we might want to monitor before we start baiting. It's not just a, it's quite in depth, uh, 1080 baiting uh, we could probably sit here and talk about it all night but it's not just a case of here you go here's 1080 all the best uh, there's quite a lot that a landholder has to do themselves to get accredited and then pass the risk assessment and things like that so um, yeah it's, it's it's just one of those things it's, it's heavily legislated or heavily regulated by the EPA uh, and, and we've got to follow that pesticide control order to the T so um, there's just properties that will you know, we can, we, you know, straight away that you won't be able to bait on and it can be frustrating for landholders that want to do their bit to control foxes. And it's, you know, it's the least resource heavy out of all the control techniques, um, but it just can't meet that pesticide control order. So it's, you know, it's down the rocks like cage trapping and things like that, that we touched on tonight. Thanks, Gary. Then, um, can, I, can I, sorry, yeah. Emma, can I just add from council's perspective? Um, look, at, I guess ceasing the baiting program is not something we took uh, lightly. Um, it is an effective control for us. And, you know, getting as many different control options out there is going to increase our success rate. Um, just to give it a bit of context, um, a lot of the reserves we bait in are, even though they're bushland reserves, they are still actually open for dog walkers on some of the trails through the reserves. So as part of the sort of protections and the PCO that Gareth's talking about, we actually need to close those reserves to the sort of dog walkers. And that's for a period of six weeks. So we've got the four week period while the baits are in the ground, but then we actually have a two week exclusion zone at the end of it. Um, and that's to deal with, um, just because a fox takes a bait doesn't mean it's going to eat it at the baiting station. It may actually take it and cache it later, which means that even though we think we know where the bait is, the fox may have relocated it. And I guess if it was trundling and foxes too, they when they move through the bush, they take the path of least resistance. So they're going to go down a, a walking track as much as we are rather than the bush bashing for no reason. And I guess if the fox gets startled, it drops the bait, it's then in an area where a dog could access it as much as we've tried to sort of put it elsewhere. So um, yeah, so look, the, it really comes down to a safety consideration for us. And I guess the thing too is if, if a fox was to take a bait on the northern beaches and that potentially stuffs it for Greater Sydney as a whole, I guess sort of it's a one in all in, it's not just going to be, well, there was an incident on sort of the northern beaches, so Parramatta or Hornsby or Karinga, I can con continue baiting. They're probably going to review the program across Greater Sydney. So it really comes down to risk management and not losing one of the sort of tools that we do do have available to us. So um, look, one, once we can sort of, as I said, if, um, and also to with closing the reserves, we felt the community was pretty impacted by COVID as it is, let alone if we start locking them out of their local reserves. So that was another consideration we had, had at the time. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's all we have time for this evening because I am conscious of um, the time. I can see that there are a couple other questions in the chat as well. So um, we might provide some links um, to um, resources and follow up with those um, outside of session as well. Uh, but thank you um, very much, everyone, for attending. And I'd like to thank Gareth and um, Sean as well. There's been a lot of, um, and Angela from Local Land Services, Greater Sydney Local Land Services. Uh, it's been a big um, effort um, in putting together presentations and um, organising all this. So thank you very much for giving up your time um, to come online with us tonight. And thank you, everyone, for um, joining. Um, and I will send around some resources um, following this session. Thanks everyone, enjoy your evening. Thank, Thank you. you, bye.